So it's Holy Week, and this is probably the weirdest Holy Week that any of us have ever experienced, and I pray will ever experience. But nonetheless, it's Holy Week. In this episode that we recorded several weeks ago before any of the pandemic, well, before it had even been named a pandemic, I interview Tim about the five questions that we've been having conversation about over the course of the past six episodes. And then on the second half of the episode, we have a conversation about how these questions come to life during Holy Week. And I have to tell you, when we got to the point where we started having a conversation about Good Friday and Holy Saturday and Resurrection Sunday, listen closely to what we say. Listen closely to the conversations. Listen, and maybe even hit the pause button as we ask you several questions about how you experience Good Friday and Saturday and Sunday. Because in this time, in this season, it might just feel like you're living on Friday or living on Saturday with the silence, the uncertainty, but there are reminders. There's hope there because when resurrection happens and what we celebrate every Sunday when we come together to worship is the new life that Jesus offers us. So in this weird Holy Week that we are all experiencing, I pray that this episode is a blessing to you, that it ministers to your soul, and it helps you to navigate this season that we are in, even though we recorded it way before the pandemic had ever come in to our little corner of the world. I pray you have a blessed Holy Week and a very, very happy Easter. You're listening to LeaderCast, episode 114. Welcome to LeaderCast, Transforming Missions podcast with Tim Bias and Sarah Thomas, providing you with insights and resources you need to lead a movement of Jesus followers. For the past five weeks, we've given you a series of five questions. We've shared stories, we've looked at scripture, we've given you examples of Christian practices or spiritual disciplines that you might explore these questions with. Today, we want to invite you to consider these questions in light of Holy Week. And if you're listening to this at a time other than Holy Week, it's okay. Not the big focus, but I just need to name the reality because this is being released on the Tuesday of Holy Week, which, oh, just happens to be the day after Tim's birthday. So we're going to interview Tim. We're we're going to me me and my alter ego, I guess. I am going to interview Tim on this episode, exploring those five questions, and with the backdrop in mind that from Palm Sunday to Resurrection morning is a journey of transformation, and these questions that we've been talking about for the past six weeks are questions that are intended to lead people of faith on a germ journey of naming the present reality and living into a future with hope. It's the same journey that we experience during Holy Week. Jesus has been teaching and preaching and sending people, and now everything is changing. That transformation didn't mean the end. It was the beginning of something new. So, We've been asking this question of what's the transformation that's desired? Where is the hope? What does Jesus teach us about that hope? And how do we experience it together so that we can be the people that God has created us to be? So all of that to say, get ready for an interview because Tim's going to share with you his thoughts on the questions that we've been exploring so that you can experience an example of these five questions all together. 
So before we go there, Tim, you want to remind folks of a few things about this whole series? Sure. Throughout uh, this Lenten season, we've been exploring a series of five questions designed to enhance whatever you already had planned for this Lenten season, and today would be no different. We're calling this series Step Into the Arena, where every week we've explored one question with stories and illustrations and leave you with a challenge that you can practice in the midst of your everyday and ordinary life. You can find a link on the show notes page at transformingmission.org forward slash 114. So, Tim, part of why I wanted to interview you to wrap this whole series up and invite you to reflect on these series of questions together is the message of hope for you is a lived reality. It's a message that I've seen you carry deep within your soul. And so it seems very appropriate to me this Holy Week for you to answer those five questions, especially since yesterday was your birthday. So are you ready? (laughs) (laughs) Do I have a choice? (laughs) I gave you another option for this this podcast. (laughs) So the real answer to that is yes. (laughs) I'm ready. So our first question was, who are the people entrusted to your care? I can answer that on several levels. Uh, one of them is as a in the position I hold in the in the church. I've been entrusted with um, with some pastors and leaders within a district, people who have responsibility for other people. So that's that's one way I can talk about people who are entrusted to my care. Some people that I that that may not look at it this way, but also have a staff of people who are entrusted to my care, who are important to me. So I take that seriously. Anything else that you want to say about the people entrusted to your care? You said well, also, you said several levels and you named you named the pastors and you named a a, staff. A staff. That that's and all and I've and, go ahead. That's all within I'll I'll put it this way, even though I know your world doesn't get divided this way. That's all within your professional life and experience. Right. I was going to add to that family, my wife, Kim, and, and our children and grandchildren. But, but, Sarah, we've not talked about it necessarily this way, but I actually feel like anybody I encounter is kind of entrusted to my care. And so whether that's colleagues around a table or people at the grocery line or in a restaurant, it's with whomever I'm with at the moment, somehow God's put me together that I feel like that maybe I'm to care for them as well. So I know that you've said this over the course of this series of episodes, but I hear you express this often that the people around you help you become who God is inviting you to be. You truly approach the people and the experiences of your day and wherever God might lead you as an encounter of, okay, God, who are you going to put put in my path today? Who might I have the opportunity to meet? Am I hearing you correctly? You are, and I wish I were that pure, but it's, uh, <laughs> but yes, Anyone who's in my path or I encounter every day, whatever situation, those persons help make me who, who I am. And that sounds like it's it's all kind of really positive and stuff. But, you know, when I lose my temper and I do it with somebody who is offering some kind of service to me, and I'll be more precise, and that is I have difficulty with people who repair, uh, who work on my car because they'll tell me, well, we can get this done and it'll cost this much. And then before it's over, they're coming back and say, well, we need to do this. We need to do this. We need to do this. And after a while, I lose my patience and I'll say something like, I don't want you working on my car any longer. I, all I needed to do was, you know, rotate the tires. 
And then I'll get short with somebody and, and I don't say anything that's mean. I just am not very nice. And then when I'm reflecting on the day, I'm saying, God, you showed up today in the life of some guy who was just doing his job. He's told he's doing exactly what he's supposed to do. And I'm cutting him off and I'm not now because I don't know him. I don't necessarily call him and say, you know, I shouldn't have acted that way. I'm sorry. But sometimes when I do that with people I know, I'll give them a call and say, I appreciate your patience with me. Okay, so for our podcast listeners, I want to offer two things. One, you just experienced the humanity of Tim Bias. He is not perfect. He is still striving towards perfection. The second thing that I'm going to say is I'm going to put on my coaching hat here just for a moment. And just observe what you just did in terms of the question was, who are the people entrusted to your care? And you started with the, with the obvious example of the pastors and your professional role, the staff that you work with, your family. And then when I said, so it's, you know, you're naming whoever comes along your path. Then you went to a place where you didn't respond in a caring way to a service that was be- being provided to you. So let me ask you the question that I started with again, with that service person in mind. Is he someone who is entrusted to your care? I think so. Okay, why? Because I'm having a, an encounter with him. You know, this sounds kind of crazy. It's just not an, a, a, a chance encounter. I can become who God created me to be with my interaction with him. And and if I'm not necessarily in the moment and thinking the way I ought to be thinking, when I am thinking about it, it is, okay, God, you were shaping me at that moment. I'm going to learn from this and I'll keep going. Okay, I am, I am going to go back to something that we did point out in one of the podcasts. Are you playing God? I don't. I, for me personally, no. I'm not playing God. You, you're simply passing. trying to care. I, I, what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is there is a difference between you caring and taking responsibility for someone else's actions or inactions or reactions. Well, yeah, right. And I agree with you. And I don't think I'm trying to take responsibility for their actions or reactions. I don't think that's what I'm doing. You're, you're, you are simply trying to show up and be a person of love and grace with whomever you encounter. Is right. that fair? I'm trying, I'm trying to be responsible for my own actions and reactions. Okay. So I think this will all become a little bit clearer as we work through the other, the other four questions. Because my, my guess is, with your car mechanic, you're not asking him, what are your longings and losses? And, and you don't have a relationship at that level. Now, you might say, yeah, but shouldn't I? I'm going to ask you to put that one on on pause, and let's just pick one of those three relationships in terms of groups of people, if I can say it that way, that are entrusted to your care to answer the remaining four (laughs) questions. Um, So either the group of pastors, the staff, your family, or your car mechanic. You decide. I won't eliminate the car mechanic and, and everyone. Which one of those groups would... <laughs> I wish you, those of you that are listening, could see the looks look on Tim's face right now because he's giving me the look that I get. You've gone into coach mode. <laughs> <laughs> so can you pick one of those? Well, since it'll be the pastors and the leaders listening to the podcast, why don't I just talk about them? Okay. So as you consider their, the experiences that you have with them, and I'm not asking you to tell secrets out of, out of school here, what are, what are the stories of longing and loss that you hear experienced in and amongst our clergy colleagues? I'm hesitating only because I want to start somewhere and just not go across the the board with everything. But, uh, you know, one of the losses that that 
that I seem to deal with with my colleagues are health issues. Mm. That's physical health as well as emotional health. And, and there's a lot of, and there is loss in that because what I, what I feel when I'm with them and I can identify is that there are things that some of them would really like to do or accomplish and they can't do it because they either physically or emotionally aren't able to do it. And there's a, there's a loss there. Um, one of the, one of the longings I've experienced is that I've got some pastors who truly um, are trying to be who God created them to be and reaching out and, and offering this hope, but they feel hampered and hampered and held back because of the communities of faith in which they're working. And that may be because of age or it may be because of lack of vision. It may be, you know, any number of things. I I understand the longing. I, I share that longing, but I experience it in, in terms of maybe that becomes a loss too, that after, after having a longing for so long and you can't get it, there's a lot of grief that goes on. And, and so those are two things and that's, that's being, that's being general, but there are other places where there are loss and longings, and that's usually when there are people at odds with each other, where there's some kind of tension, and whether there's a desire to for reconciliation or whether there's a desire to have the superintendent set our body straight, there's a there's longing and loss in that. Because that's your job. No, <laughs> <laughs> it's not. So and. You know, the only time, and you're not asking this question, but this is one of the places that's one of my growing edges, and that is the only time that that longing and loss ever get me crossways is when somebody's trying to leverage me for something. Then I'm somebody that needs to have, as we've talked in some of our previous podcasts, Need confession, forgiveness, and humility. <laughs> so, as you think about those longings and losses, what's the big lie that is preventing people from really embodying and leading people to share and experience God's love in the midst of that? Well, you're you're asking, and this is really my perception more than anything else. But there there are a couple of things. One of them is it's not the total makeup of of our colleagues, but it is part of the makeup of people who enter ministry, and that is we're always struggling to show that we're good enough. And I think that's one of the lies that we tell ourselves is we're just not good enough, so we work harder. And and not smarter, but we work harder, and and we fill our schedules up because if we're busy, then we're showing that we're really worth something. And we've talked about that, and that really gets in the way of 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 not only hearing the gospel but even sharing the gospel. Another one of those lies uh, that prevent our colleagues from hearing the gospel is they make an assumption that the communities of faith in which they have been given responsibility to lead and to love and to serve, that everyone there wants to be led, loved, <laughs> and served. <laughs> which seems like a, a really rational assumption to make. <laughs> right. But So the, the, the big lie is, is that, these people want me and 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 they they're willing to follow and they're willing to be connected to the community they're they're willing and if i may say using the language we're using that's a big lie <laughs> and so that creates a lot of anxiety and and i think the way uh, my experience with our colleagues trying to deal with anxiety is that they either Tell them tell themselves another lie, and that is, there's really no one I can talk with, and so they 
isolate themselves. And and that and the reason I say that's a lie is that and they've got you or me. Well, the this is where we turn the corner and start to start to experience some hope. How do you make spiritual sense of those the longings and losses and the big lies that you've named? I'm going to say this in slightly a different way. That has been our that's the question that we that we offered on the podcast. How I would say it to you is what are you reminding the pastors and leaders in the district of over and over and over again? In every context, I think, whether that's one-to-one, whether that's preaching, whether that's in some kind of workshop, and, and whether it's just right in your face or whether it's subtle, it's all that you're loved by God, you're created by God, you're a child of God, you're children of God, you're the community of God. You're not here by accident. God wants to use you to make a difference in the world, and God will use the world or the community to make a difference with you. So I think I think relationships is part of that. I liked it when we did the podcast where we talk about confession and forgiveness. I don't know that I've asked very many of our pastors to enter into a time of confession and forgiveness. But but I think that is a, a way to make spiritual sense out of the longings and the losses is that just confess that where we are is where we are. And God, now where do, how do we go to the next step? And that's what I would understand confession to be more than trying to cover it up. Because until we, as we've said, name reality, we live out of out of something that's not real. And so so just naming reality, knowing that we're loved by God and that God wants to use us just the way um, he wants us to reach people. So taking what you you just said, God wants to use us to reach people when you were talking about you're loved by God, you're a child of God. I want to ask you a question about all all of those words and and you reminding people of that over and over and over again. I know the answer to this question. I want the people listening to hear the answer to this question. Is that a spiritual pep talk for you or is that a true belief about the nature of God and your purpose as a follower of Jesus? So before I answer that question, I'll ask you a question. Have you ever been with me when I've given a pep talk? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you don't know how hard it was for me to keep a straight face and ask you that question. So you're already um, getting a clue in Tim's answer to this question, folks. <laughs> I, it's who I am and it's what I believe. It's what I live. My personality, whether I like it or not, is that, I, you know, I think I am an encourager but I'm not a pep person. And and I would not make a good cheerleader, although I should be more in, in the corner of some people just cheering them on. I think I'm more the person that gives them a foundation on which they can work. And so because often in the past year we've talked about courage, you do realize that you just used a word that embodies that. <laughs> And and I would say it takes courage to remind people of who they are in Christ in a world that is speaking about longings and loss and lies. Just wanted to go down a little a little alley there, and we'll detour back onto the main road now, and and come back to to our main question. And this is this is the last question. Um, question number five was: How do you express? the spiritual meaning uh, that you just named as a shared story of future hope. And you may have already started to answer this when you were talking about the previous question. Well, this is the, this is the main question. I, yeah. All, it, all of these four questions all lead up to <laughs> this question to get and, to this point. And we are in Holy Week and we're, we're moving toward the cross and then through the cross to the resurrection. So there are some things that, to make spiritual sense of longings and losses, gets us to the place of the cross so that we can get to the resurrection. And 
you reminded me of that, that one of the things that that's just a gift to all of us is we can be vulnerable. We can offer who we are as we are because we're loved as we are. Um, if, if we're centered upon this God who has already said to us, nothing, absolutely nothing is going to separate you from my love and Jesus. If we actually, if we actually build our lives upon that kind of promise, then we can be vulnerable. What's going to hurt us? What, what's, going to, what's going to take away whatever we're trying to protect? And one of the things that you just mentioned in, in the midst of that is that, is that the reason I think I repeat things over and over and over is because I'm consistent. That's a value I have. Truer words were never spoken. And, and I think that one of the ways we begin to express a spiritual meaning for that shared hope is just is living into the values that make us who we are and claim those and not, and, and not necessarily you know, try to be somebody we, we aren't. We can be who we are. We can be vulnerable enough to live into those values and then to really step out in, in faith, trusting, because it's in the midst of that trust that we will experience the resurrection. So in a, in a shared story, then, you got to have people who are going to be willing to be vulnerable, have the conversation, and um, be who they're supposed to be, so you can trust stepping into whatever God has for you. And that's kind of the way I look at it. So can I ask you a bonus round because it's Holy Week? <laughs> so my I'm standard totally response surpri- I'm totally is totally surprising consistent. him by this. <laughs> my standard answer by being consistent is do I have a choice? <laughs> well, you ask the question. I'll ask the questions and then we'll decide whether we actually share them. I I'm thinking about everything that you've just said and I'm also thinking about Holy Week and I'm thinking about how I have expressed the journey from Good Friday to Resurrection Morning and having to experience all three of those. As you were just speaking about showing up and being vulnerable and being who God created us to be, and you think about the longings and losses of the people that are entrusted to your care and trying to trying to lead them to make spiritual sense of what they're experiencing all around them. What is the cross? What is the cross that the people who are entrusted to your care are experiencing today? And maybe if it's not the cross, maybe if it's not them being crucified, it's, it is their presence there at the cross and experiencing that. Sarah, we'll probably talk around in circles with this for a minute until we uh, get to the to the real point. But I think I think part of the the cross for my colleagues is the um, they're trying to make sense out of a lot of confusion that creates pain for them. They're being faithful. They're being faithful, and they're trying to make sense out of why that faithfulness creates such anxiety. And this sounds like a, a soundbite. I'm saying it as a question. Love has a cost. It, it does, but until you have to pay the cost, it may be that we tell ourselves a story, and that is that when we're all about love, it's all going to be good, and it's going to be painless, and it's all going to work well. But when when we become vulnerable and we... And we do step out to love where we've been called to do it. And it's not because it's a task. It's, it becomes who we really are. And that becomes betrayed. Or it creates a pain that we did not expect. It's hard to look beyond Friday. Uh, the good news 
And I think what we'd want... Hang on, what hang I'd, on, hang on, hang on. Okay. You're going to jump, you can't jump to Sunday. That's my point in all of this and asking you this bonus round. So what's the silence that we have to sit in on Saturday? As you consider the longings and the losses, the big lies that are stopping us from hearing the good news of God's love, as, you, as we try to make spiritual sense, what is the silence? of Saturday that we need to sit with the pain to say it another way. Well, the, the pain the is struggle. part of it. I think we did a, you let us do a little exercise a few um, episodes ago that you, you at least should count to four before you breathe again. <laughs> I think, I think it was breathe in and count to four, breathe out, count to four. <laughs> well, to, to maintain my, that calm. It was a my, practice of breathing to help folks experience the calm. So my 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 point is is that maybe Saturday, in the midst of all of its chaos and un, and uncertainty, it's a place where you really need to stop and breathe to experience the calm in the midst of all the garbage and if I may say crap and all the other stuff going on. We're not called to this because we don't know the end of the story. The pause is important though. And the and reminding reminding one another of that calm in in the midst of the chaos and confusion is important. It's essential. That is often where we speed through and we go off track. And it's where missteps happen in leadership and indiscretions happen and bad choices happen and we sacrifice health and family and the list could go on and on because we we haven't hit that pause. I'm now answering the question for you. I'm sorry. Let, let's right, move I on. like your answer. Let's move on to the to the good news. The so what is the what is the promised hope? What is the the new story? What is the resurrection promise that we experience in the midst of the longings and the losses, in the midst of the big lies, in the midst of trying to make spiritual sense of it all? What is the promise of God that is the future with hope? Everything that you have named is true. It happens. It's a part of our lived experience. And yet what sets us apart as followers of Jesus is a belief in the new life that we find in Jesus Christ, the resurrection. So what is that promise new hope? So what I'm what I'm thinking is is that this has happened to me a couple of times in this podcast is that I get down to where it's so deep and before I can say the next thing I lose my breath it takes my breath away and then I can get my breath back and continue to go on that may be somewhat of a metaphor from Thursday to uh, from Friday to Sunday is that what we experience is so profoundly life-changing that we actually, as I was uh, playing with it there for a few minutes, we, we, we actually lose our breath. But the resurrection gives us a new breath. And if you want to play with breath and spirit, that may be what you can play with but it gives us new life. And that new life we go with isn't going back to what we once had. It's what, it's what can be for the future. And we really can't plan that. We can live into it and then begin to see how it all works. But before we go through it, we can't say, well, when we get to the resurrection, we'll do this. Because I think the story is even the ones closest to it had difficulty. And it was only when they began to wrestle with the new life, the, the, what was on the other side, 
that they receive the kind of transformational power to change the world. It wasn't what they took into it. It's what God gave them on the other side. And so when we talk about connecting with people and, and, and loving people and being in the community and that, you know, until you get through it, you just don't know. And it's going to be an inconvenience and it's going to take your breath and it's going to, you know, it's going to be everything you don't want because everything you wanted is gone. But then you step into it. And if I may say it this way, my God, I didn't expect this. Right. And once you experience it, you'd say, how did we ever miss this? Right. How good is this? I mean, we've worked together for, what, 10 years, maybe longer. It seemed like a long time. (laughs) We've worked together for a number of years. But how many times have we said that? When we had to make decisions, we stepped into something we didn't know it was going to be. And when on the other side, we'd say, can you believe this is going on? And, and that's what that, this whole series has been about. We've invited you to step into the arena, to experience that lived reality, and to wrestle with some hard things. I mean, really, who wants to talk about longings and losses? <laughs> If we're honest, none of us do. But that's part of the reality of the human condition. And and what you what you just humored me with in term you did more than humor me. I'm playing with you. In terms of those that bonus round question is we're on a journey, folks. And it doesn't just happen when the calendar says Holy Week and it says Good Friday. <laughs> And it says Easter Sunday. That is the story that we have the privilege of leading people to experience week after week and day after day. To sit with people in the hard moments and, and to be present in the, in the everyday ordinary moments of life. Even when it means sitting at the foot of the cross and experiencing that pain. And that's where we reckon with what are we feeling and what's going on inside of our souls. And then on Saturday, there's that silence and that doubt and that worry and that questioning and all of the the stories that we make up. And we talked about them as confabulations and conspiracies. We didn't talk about them on the podcast as SFDs. I'll let you do a little Google search on that one. (laughs) But that's what's happening. We write stories. And most of the time, those stories are very creative. But what is truth in there, in that, does not get revealed until we have the courage to experience that reckoning of Friday, that rumbling of Saturday, and that rumbling sounds pretty quiet (laughs) on Saturday, so that we can rise with Christ on Sunday and experience that new life. That has been the journey of seven weeks that we've invited you on to experience, to step into the arena so that that joy of Sunday that is coming, that you are preparing for, you can live again and celebrate with all its glory, but you're not going to experience it in the same way as you would have if you didn't answer the questions of knowing who you care about and who's entrusted to your care. And getting clear about the longings and losses and naming those lies that are stopping us and holding us back from seeing the promise of God and then making sense of it all so that we can encounter together the new life of the resurrection. So this week, my challenge to you, as we've done for the past six weeks, is to ask yourself that question. That I just asked him that bonus question. What's your cross? 
What are you experiencing in the silence of Saturday? And then what do you anticipate with great hope on Sunday? And maybe if you're really courageous, you won't just answer it, but you'll ask other people. Ask that question as you're going about your everyday ordinary life, as you're waiting in line at Starbucks, as you're picking kids up from school, as you're folding the laundry, as you're changing a diaper, as you're going to visit someone in the hospital or someone who is in a care facility. And then step into Sunday. And don't just tell the story. Don't just tell the story of new life and resurrection. Experience the story of resurrection. Go lead a movement of Jesus followers. Bye for now.